coming. Food has become one of my favorite topics of late, and I am just so thrilled to have two of the most outstanding medical students I've ever encountered in my time teaching. Uh, Robert is a third year medical student here, and he has taught me so much about food. And Brittany um, is a second year medical student and has done a lot of work uh, to try and bring more nutrition education into our into medical school curriculum. So, just really glad that you're here. And um, the title of the talk is Dr. Clean, How the Anti-Inflammatory Diet Heals All Humans, Including You, because doctors too are humans. So the objectives today, we're going to review the connection between chronic illness, inflammation, and diet. It's real. It exists. And it happens to us, too. Um, and then we're going to learn how eating anti-inflammatory can promote well-being for us and then also for our patients. And then we're going to give you some tips, some practical tips, to increase your nutritional status at work. Because I know how challenging it is to find nutritional food in general, but when you're busy and you have 35 patients to see or whatever, it can be very, very hard to eat good food. But we have some ideas. So I'll start with the case report. This is a case of a 31-year-old <laughs> medical resident. Um, past medical history was significant for two unplanned pregnancies <laughs> that ended in um, complicated low transfer of cesarean sections. So um, this resident um, had been on birth control and miraculously had been fortunately blessed with two beautiful children. That was me. I <laughs> guess <laughs> <laughs> you guys have to figure that out. But I. Um, you know, I was really thinking that maybe I didn't want to have another child during residency. You know, it's quite hard to come in with a one-year-old and then to become pregnant with my daughter as a second-year resident. Um, so I thought, okay, well, maybe I should have an IUD placed. And um, two months after my daughter was born, I went in and I um, had an IUD placed. And it hurt quite a bit. Um, and I went home that night and it was hurting a lot. And I had peritoneal signs. And my husband David was caring for me, and we called the gynecologist, and they shooed me off. They told me it was no big deal, like get in the bathtub, take some ibuprofen. So I did, and then I did that resonant thing of like, okay, I'm really sick, but I'm going to go to work. And I did for a week, until it, the pain became so severe that I ended up having to have surgery to remove this IUD that was actually in my peritoneal space. So two years later, you know, all of you guys, a lot of you have known me at this time, you probably thought I was a very healthy person, but I started to have a lot of problems. Uh, I started to have severe chronic constipation, like the kind of constipation where I wouldn't go for like a week, sometimes two, severe constipation. Uh, muscle aches and pains, a lot of colds. I've always been blind, but I was completely blind at that time. I was overweight, about 15 pounds overweight, and a little muffin top. I would get frequent bloating. I had allergies. Um, I had aptos ulcers that would come every once in a while for who knows why. Um, chronic low back pain, neck spasm. My voice had scoliosis, but um, it was pretty bad back then. And I also hadn't had a period since my daughter was born. But the worst part of it was that because of that IUD that was up here, I had a, a, a hard mass of scar tissue that went from my pubic bone all the way to my liver, like a football, hard as a rock. And so that was where I was having this constipation. It took me a really long time to figure out what was behind all these symptoms because they seemed so unconnected. Um, and then also in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe it's just that I'm in my 30s. You know, I've had some kids. Maybe this is just what it's like to get older. But at one point, I kind of thought, well, maybe I should try and do something about this adhesion thing. But I was at a loss. Um, my first day of surgical rotation as a third year, I remember seeing all these patients with these chronic adhesions that there was no cure for. Um, I remember the surgeon saying, the person who can identify a cure for adhesions is going to win the Nobel Prize. Okay. Um, and then I find myself in this position of being a patient where there is no cure and there's no hope. Medicine had really nothing to offer me. And when I find myself in these predicaments of really not knowing what to do, 
often I go back to the truisms that I've learned throughout my training, like first do no harm. You know? And so I, I latched on to physician heal thyself and thought, okay, well, no one's going to be able to heal me. I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. And um, I've been practicing yoga since I was 21, and I love yoga. And one thing that Robert said to me once was, I've never left a doctor's office feeling as good as I do when I leave a yoga class. And it's true. For me, too, I know the power of whole healing benefits of yoga. And so I became a yoga teacher this year. And um, that's been a, a major part of my recovery. And then the other phrase that I've latched on to is, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. There is no medicine to cure my adhesions. Um, but I started looking into the anti-inflammatory diet and started practicing the anti-inflammatory diet. And I'm absolutely astounded and thrilled to say that after one year of doing a lot of yoga and eating really, really, really well, all of those problems are gone. And this football-sized rock of scar tissue that there's no treatment for, it's getting a lot smaller. And so I'm just here to say that diet and exercise, it works. It absolutely works. It is transforming me. And it's transforming my patients, too, because I know this to be true. I talk about it all the time. I, I bring handouts to my patients. Oh, yeah, diabetes. Well, <laughs> we're going to lose some weight. And because I do what I'm telling them they should do, they listen. And because I know that it works, they're inspired to make a change. <coughs> uh, so just going back here to, um, have you guys heard of the real age calculator? Anyone? Yeah, a couple of people. So when I was 33, um, when I had all these symptoms, calculating my real age, I was 38 with all these symptoms. The other day I went back on and I calculated my real age, and now I'm 35, but I'm really 26. <laughs> so not only has eating this way and doing this kind of really intense exercise, yoga is not easy, not only has it resolved my medical issues, but I'm getting younger. <laughs> Um, so now that brings us to Brittany, who's going to talk to us about the standard American diet, aka SAD, SAD diet, um, <laughs> and go over the literature behind the anti-inflammatory diet, the vegan diet, um, so that you know that there's actual real evidence. My story isn't just a limited one patient story. This, this is true for all sorts of people. As Dr. Campbell was saying, there are many stories about how people have changed their diets and changed their lives and are constantly being told what you should and shouldn't eat. But it makes us wonder, how are we really supposed to be eating right now? So the standard American diet is something that has its roots 10,000 years ago in the way that people have been eating. And it's changed so much in the past 60 years, such that there's been an increase in calories by 761 calories per day which means that a lot of people are eating far beyond the recommended 2,000 calories a day. And most of that is due to the fact that a lot of people are snacking and eating out. And the diet itself consists of eating an excess of calories. Most of those calories are coming from refined carbohydrates, eating lots of meats and fats. And having a calorie-dense diet like that, people are failing to actually ingest nutrients from fruits and vegetables. What this means is that people are eating more total grains, but fewer whole grains that actually have those important nutrients in them. Also, people are eating half of the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables per day. What this means for our health, the implications that this diet has, is that it places Americans at a higher risk for heart disease, diabetes, and metabolic dysfunction. You can see here how much we've evolved from the start of time. <laughs> And so because the average American is eating this diet, it makes us wonder even more, what is going on with the people who are very busy and find even less time for nutrition? So in general, do you guys feel that doctors eat better than the average American or worse? So show of hands for better. About the same. Well, <laughs> yeah, how about worse? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I think probably a lot of our bad eating habits stem from what we learned when we were in our clinical training. Um, so I, I came up with a little term here, the standard American resident, uh, standard American diet resident style. Um, so it's even sadder than <laughs> sad because in addition to the same high carb, really protein rich, processed food diets that most Americans eat, we combine the fact that we are so busy that sometimes we go an entire day without eating. We go an entire day without drinking. And then, have you guys heard that freegan, freegan term before? We're all freegans. We don't have time to bring our food, so we eat whatever we can find. And usually that consists of new conference, which sometimes is something helpful, but sometimes it's pizza and junk. Um, those little crackers that you can find, you know, the patients eat, like, we, we, yeah. So, so there's that, but then also that we're so deprived that we go around in this state of um, hanger. Hanger? <laughs> Anyone ever been hangry before? Yeah, as a mother of two and a woman married to David Campbell, I experienced that, you know, it's so important that we eat consistently or else our, our emotional state suffers. And we walk around in a really irritable, sort of um, way of, of relating to people. Just to clarify what freegan is, <laughs> freegan are people who actually go around town and find food wherever possible, so sometimes somebody else's garden, from a dumpster. It's an interesting little revolution, dietary-wise. Going along with this, though, we're talking about how we don't know how to eat because of the lack of education during medical school curriculum. We found that only 41% of medical schools across the country actually meet the recommended number of nutrition curriculum hours. For, in my experience, I found that we haven't had any specific courses on nutrition thus far. We were given a small book at the start of the year that was based on nutrition, but we haven't actually received any instruction on it. Um, there was a study done where they looked at the view of nutrition, so nutritional attitudes at the beginning of med medical school, the middle, and at the start of residency. And it was found that during the time, people viewed nutrition as being more important at the start of medical school and less important as their training progressed. That brings us to show that we really do need to make more of a concerted effort to have nutrition education in medical school, both here at the University of Colorado and across the country. So how should we eat? There's so much confusion. There are always new diets coming out, and we don't really know which one to follow. There's the vegetarian diet, the vegan diet, South Beach diet, Atkins diet. And they're very trendy for a while, and then it comes out maybe a couple years later that they're actually very unhealthy. So that brings us to looking at some of the literature. And what we have is that most of the evidence points toward the vegan diet being the healthiest. It's been shown to promote longevity, to reduce coronary artery disease, to reverse prostate cancer. It also very clearly stimulates weight loss because you're ingesting far fewer calories and less calories from fat. It also reduces cholesterol, blood pressure, and has a positive impact on mood. In one study, this is, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the Ornish, Ornish spectrum. This is looking at different diets and how they can impact health. It was found that um, telomerase activity would increase after a one year of lifestyle intervention. What this meant was that the telomeres at the ends of chromosomes, their DNA protein complexes, are actually shortened as we age. And the enzyme responsible for reversing that shortening is telomerase. Shortened telomeres are a negative prognostic marker because they've been shown to be related to cancer risk, progression of cancer, and premature mortality. In this study, they looked at low-risk prostate cancer in men, and they were given a lifestyle intervention for one year's time. And at the end of that year, telomerase activity was increased. The lifestyle change was a vegan diet. It was a low-fat diet that was very rich in whole foods and plant-based foods, and very low in carbohydrates. In addition to the diet, there was moderate exercise, it was most days a week, six days, and stress management. In addition, other studies have shown that the vegan diet and vegetarian diets have been very beneficial to the heart. The Lifestyle Heart Trial was the first randomized controlled clinical trial to investigate whether patients could be motivated to actually make lifestyle changes 
and whether or not these changes could actually cause regression of coronary atherosclerosis. These were done in the late 1970s, and the way that these results were actually quantified were by doing angiography at baseline and at one year, 195 lesions were identified, and over time, in that one year, they were reduced. Stenosis was reduced in those groups, and also the frequency, duration, and severity of angina was reduced. Lastly, the anti-inflammatory diet, which is what we're discussing today, is different from the vegan diet in that there's more wiggle room. It's not as strict. Meat is allowed. Some animal products are allowed, as in dairy. And so it's more feasible for the average person, but has just as many health benefits. In this study, participants, there were 68 patients who for eight months followed either a Western diet, which is the standard American diet, or an anti-inflammatory diet. And what the study looked at was whether or not we could reduce the production of eicosanoids and other markers of inflammation. And it was found that that was true. They looked at peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And over time, with fish supplementation and the lacto-vegetarian diet, that people who had rheumatoid arthritis did show decreased laboratory markers of the disease and also had fewer symptoms on a daily basis. So just a little bit about what the anti-inflammatory diet is. Um, so this is the anti-anti-inflammatory diet. This is very similar to the, to the standard American diet. These are the foods that increase inflammation. Uh, and on here you'll find such things as red meat, refined oils, uh, refined carbohydrates and sugars, grilled and processed meats, dairy products, chemical additives and preservatives, and foods that you're allergic or sensitive to. And that last point is, is, is a really big one because a lot of us have food intolerances that we have no idea that we have until we eliminate them. And so many of us walk around with a food intolerance that triggers inflammation in our bodies for years and years and years and years. And that may contribute to atherosclerosis and all these other chronic diseases. But the, the anti-inflammatory diet, these are all really good foods. You should have as many of these foods as you can, as often as you can, because they decrease inflammation. Um, ginger is a potent anti-inflammatory agent, turmeric as well. Green tea, delicious, good to substitute coffee with. Um, and then omega-3 fatty acids. So wild salmon is better than farmed salmon in terms of nutrients. And um, if you actually look at farmed salmon before they add the pink to it, it's kind of brown. Wild salmon, you know, it has that pink red color. And that is a sign of how much goodness is in it. Um, flax, walnuts, leafy greens, oh, God bless kale. Kale is a wonderful way to reduce inflammation and purify fish oil. Um, so fruits, vegetables, grains, real foods. Real foods can decrease inflammation and can be medicine. So food allergies. Um, anyone here have a gluten intolerance? Okay, just us two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we figured it out. No, so we know. All <laughs> um, so forty percent of people have gluten intolerance without knowing it. So I'm not talking about celiac disease, which is way <coughs> smaller number, but intolerance. So you eat a big pizza meal, and then you feel kind of the next day, maybe you feel a little foggy, but you get bloated. Um, maybe you have constipation. That was certainly the case for me, and I never ever would have thought I was gluten intolerant until I cut out the gluten and then tried it back again. And I keep thinking, oh wait, well maybe my gluten intolerance will go away. So then I'll try the gluten again, and then I'll get sick again. And it's just taken me probably about 20 times to realize, and I'll still, I'm sure I'll still eat the pizza again next week, but it's not good for me. Um, there, have, there have actually been studies that have shown that even normal healthy people who aren't gluten intolerant, um, have no symptoms, still have an inflammatory response to a big gluten load. So it still causes inflammation even if you don't feel it. Dairy is the number two most common food allergy. And um, this one, you know, is a little easier in that usually people, when they have dairy, start to feel gas, bloating, abdominal symptoms right away. Um, the one that's a little bit harder to tease out is the congestion. 
I think it's fairly common just to have congestion after you eat dairy, but um, I've noticed since I've cut dairy mostly out, I get congested when I eat it, and that can contribute to science problems. Um, yeast, bloating, gas fatigue, a lot of these, these allergies, the number one symptom is bloating. And so we get a lot of patients complaining of bloating in our clinics, and we think about dairy and we think about gluten and their irritable bowel symptom, syndrome workup, but all the other allergies should be considered as well. But the two most common are gluten and dairy, and so those are things that you should think about for your patients and also for yourself. How to tell if you're allergic? Obviously this can be a really difficult task, but the first step would be to try an elimination diet. What this means, it's like Dr. Campbell was saying, if you eat something that causes you any sort of discomfort, try to identify what that was. The next step is to try to eliminate that from your diet, at least for a couple of weeks, and observe how you feel. Observe how you felt when you ate that food and how you feel when you're not eating it. And then slowly, if you've done this with multiple foods, reintroduce one food at a time and observe the systemic response. If this is not really possible for you, or if this isn't a successful effort, then blood testing is the next option, and that's looking at serum IgE to actually gauge an allergic response to a food. Uh, so I love Dean Ornish. Uh, he's from UCSF. He's done the best research on food and coronary artery disease and cancer. He's done amazing research, and one of my favorite quotes of his is, I don't understand why asking people to eat a well-balanced vegetarian diet is considered drastic. While it is medically conservative to cut people open and put them on cholesterol and allergy drugs for the rest of their lives, right? I mean, doesn't it make sense to at least try these things first? So now we're going to take a little break. Um, whoever does not have a cup of juice in front of them, raise their hand. Okay. So those of you who've been in my workshops before, it's not a new thing that I'm having you drink juice. <laughs> What is new is that instead of Otwala or um, apple juice, this stuff is fresh made with love. <laughs> <laughs> Straight from the kitchen of Brittany and then from my Vitamix this morning. Um, so everything in here is fresh organic vegetable. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the ingredients are because that's your task, is to try and guess what's in these things. So everyone hold up their cup. If you have two cups, then you get to try both. If you only have one cup, then save the one that you have. So lift up that cup and take a look at what's inside. Notice the colors, maybe the weight of the cup in your hand. Swirl it around a little bit. Look at the shine on the top of it. And then bring your nose to the cup. And take a deep breath in and try and smell all the vegetables and fruits that are inside here. And then um, go ahead and take a little sip. Noticing perhaps the texture and the flavors. Take another sip. See if you can pick out any of the subtler flavors. Is there anything? Spicy, a little spicy, a little sweet. Can you taste the vegetables? Mm -hmm. Are there beets in them? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's an easy one. <laughs> well, this for a non vegan. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and finish drinking it and, and try to, after you're done, try and pay attention to how this feels to your body to eat this. So before we move on, um, so for the green one, what, what did people, what do you think send us? Banana. Cucumber. Banana? Banana? Banana. Strawberry? Banana. Strawberry? Okay. Any other thoughts? What's I guess kale. Kale? Because I love kale. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be a kale.
fail. <laughs> uh, maybe I want to plan. Any any other fruits? Please, any other apples? Apples. apples. Okay. How about additives? Can you t can you taste any superfoods in here? There's some superfoods. Flax. Flax. Yeah. Doctor Dan, you should you should probably deal with. Yeah. I didn't drink the green one this time, but oh, okay. um. he got his fill. He was just my resident. Every morning I'm bringing in green smoothies. Chia seeds. Chia seeds. Yep. All right. So for you, how about the the red juice, the beet juice? You got that one. So what's in the beet juice? Ginger. Ginger. There's some citrus in there too. Is it carrot? No. Any other fruit? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the green one, which we call the Dr. Clean Green Smoothie, um, banana, apple, pear. So we didn't get the pear. Uh, it's not kale. <coughs> I do you for a loop. A bunch of spinach. Um, spinach is great too. It just is a little bit. It's a little bit less um, sharp tasting, so it's easier to sneak in. That's the way I sneak in vegetables to my kids' diet. Blend them a berry smoothie and throw some peel in it. Don't tell them. Um, celery, ginger is in there. Hemp hearts, avocado, flax, and chia seeds. So for <laughs> Brittany just came up with the name for this one. It's called the heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> and ginger and so the difference is this is a smoothie it was made in the blender I just throw everything into the blender cover it up with water blends and then you have breakfast I, I eat this for breakfast every morning um, with the juice it's a juicer you juice it and you, you um, lose a lot of the fiber but you still retain the nutrients uh, all right I'm, I'm Robert I'm a third-year medical student and um, so my part of the talk is it's really kind of asking the question, how could, how could this be applied practically? And, um, and so as a, as a third year medical student, I'm on the wards. So of course, my first question when we were talking about this presentation last night was, am I going to get pimped on this tomorrow? <laughs> uh, and my, my defense for that is that, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a kind of thought experiment and see, and, and see what it would look like to transition from the refrigerator on the right to the refrigerator on the left, and um, and and see if we could practically do it. So I think that I think that most of us would recognize the refrigerator on the right as pretty pretty similar to the refrigerator in the resident lounge, and um, and it makes a lot of sense too. Actually, I mean, they're, it's they're they're packaged foods, so they're easy to pick up, they're easy to transport, they're usually cheap. And if not free, and um, you can eat them now, you can eat them later. But I think a lot of us, I think I think most of us, medical students, residents, and physicians, would like to eat a little bit more in line with the refrigerator on the left. But it's it's totally impractical. It's if this looked like if this were the refrigerator in the resident lounge, everything would be molded and it would never get eaten. Um, <laughs> So that's my question. How how could we how could we practically eat this refrigerator on the left? And so the other thing is besides the food is are the beverages. And so if I were to think of the top, let's say six out of ten beverages on the wards, it would look something like this. Um, and I mean curiously, no, we don't. No one's going to eat uh, six donuts at once, four pieces of pie, an overflowing bowl of of ice cream. <coughs> These are caloric and sugar equivalents. And I, I really do think this is probably the six most common foods on the boards, except for a cup of coffee. Um, and, and, uh, but no one wants to be eating the foods that they're associated with. So, so Michael Pollan wrote a book recently uh, called Food Matters, and he put this little list on it, and I really like it. And I think it's really simple. And I think it's a good guide. So this was kind of my framework for if this were the aim to make this kind of food available in the wards, uh, what would it look like? So uh, my great-grandmother would recognize it. Uh, it would have um, 
It would have foods that we'd find in the, in the usual kitchen. Uh, no high fructose corn syrup, um, no sugar or sweetener in the top five, in the top three ingredients, no more than five ingredients, no ingredients that, that a third grader or I can't pronounce. Um, nothing that makes health claims, nothing that says it's low fat or it's no fat or that it's um, uh, makes some claim that it prob probably isn't true, nothing that's advertised on TV, and things that would be more likely to be found on the periphery of the supermarket rather than the middle where, where there's primarily processed foods. And so there, here's my experience, or my experiment. So typically, so the beautiful thing about being on the wards is that we basically get a free lunch every day. Um, and it's very filling, and it doesn't cost us anything. Uh, the downside to it is that it's not always the most nutritious meal. And so I think one of the more, and there's a variety, but I think one of the more common ones is pizza. So this would be, this is actually the equivalent of two slices of like Domino veggie best pizza. Um, and so I want to look at, if you looked at a veggie pizza, two slices versus a quinoa bowl, and the reason I choose quinoa is just because it's a little bit higher in protein as a grain, um, and it's gluten free, it's not inflammatory, so it fits well in this lecture. Um, and then here are uh, the veggies that I put with it. Spinach, uh, sprouts, mushroom, broccoli, carrots, peppers, chickpeas, corn, sunflower seeds, and like a sesame sauce. And so they're not, they're not perfectly equal, but you know, as we'd ex I think anyone, if you were just to estimate it, everyone here would say that the quinoa bowl is probably healthier than a veggie pizza, uh, lower fat, um, and so, uh, or lower cholesterol, less saturated fat, lower sodium. Uh, so if this, was, if this was the example, I think the other thing that people would say is that the difficulty is that it's, it costs so much more to make, um, to make a quinoa bowl than just order pizza. And so, uh, so comparing the prices, so I wanted to look at if we were to, so if you got Domino pizza and each person had six slices, it would cost about $2 a slice per person. Oh, the G person had two slices. It'd be about six bucks per person. And if you broke down all of the ingredients that I mentioned and you bought them at a supermarket, it would be about six dollars too. And then actually, if you bought them, if you bought them in bulk and you had to buy them, so let's say you're making them in your kitchen, it would be about four dollars per person. So, so it wouldn't necessarily cost any more. But then there's the inconvenience of no, no one is going to. One, it's, this isn't readily available. I mean, you can't go, unless someone was to make a trip to maybe Whole Foods and buy this and then bring it for lunch. Um, there aren't a lot of places that you can buy it. And second, it's really inconvenient for people to try to make it at home, prepare it before, spend lunch time doing it. Um, and so then I wanted to see, would it be possible to, um, to find a way so that we could get this food delivered. So if you look, so if there are about 30 people um, at noon conference a day, and if you can save $2 per person by having it kind of um, bought and prepared, then it would save uh, about 60 bucks a day. And, uh, and so this would be the same as, so then I called a bunch of caterers uh, and chefs, and I asked them how much would it cost to make this, and how much time would it take to make this, and uh, in your, in, you buy the food, you prepare it, and you deliver it to, you know, 10 hospitals a day or, or whatever it might be. And it would cost about uh, $60 per day for caterers to do it. So you could, you could, so we could, we could get meals like this, and it wouldn't exclusively have to be quinoa bowls, but you could have meals <coughs> like that that cost the same every day for lunch. Um, and then my thought was, well, what if you, what if you, and then most caterers said we could probably do it for less. We could probably do it once we had a system. We could be down in one hour. So then if you had a surplus of money, um, what about the drinks? And so you could, um, so then I said, all right, if we made a smoothie and we, and we threw a lot of um, kind of exotic ingredients in it that cost a little bit more, and this was the substitute for a Diet Coke, um, it would look something like these, these things on the bottom. And it would be, and so these are, so this would be, so then I priced, 
how much it would cost to make a smoothie with coconut or almond milk, goji berries, cacao powder, maca powder, uh, blueberry, banana, sea salt, and, and bean pollen. And it wouldn't cost any more than $4, and if it was the same process as making these bowls, it would probably be closer to something like $2, $3. So in, in the end, most people, if they're not provided with the drink, are going to spend a buck fifty, two dollars anywhere for their for their drink. Um, and so the the whole the point of it was was just to see that eating like this on the wards is something that could be practical and it could be simple, and it would be really nice to be able to finish the end of the week knowing that you had at least a third of your meals that were really healthy, that were really nutrient dense and not our average lunches. Um, and so the last thing I want to talk about are, are some of the superfoods. And so superfoods has become this overused catch-all phrase. Um, but I just think of it as, as these foods that would be really nutrient dense and, um, and would be good substitutions for common foods, that they would be lots of complex carbohydrates, uh, not simple carbs. And so this is a short list of a few of them that I think are really easily introduced into the diet and could be common things on the ward. So quinoa, so this I, I mentioned, it's actually not a grain, it's a, it's a seed. Uh, and it has all nine essential amino acids, it's complete protein, it's gluten free, 12 grams of protein per cup. Uh, the next one is chia seeds. Chia seeds are actually the same seeds that you use to make a chia bed. And uh, but they're a complete protein, high in omega-3 fatty acids, fibers, antioxidants. Uh, and they, you can soak them in water overnight, and they make this, um, and they become really gelatinous. And then you can blend them with things like cacao and um, maple syrup or honey, and you can make a pudding with them that's really nutrient-dense and healthy. Uh, another thing is hemp seeds. So hemp seeds are another... Um, complete protein, and they're only exceeded by spirulina and blue green algae. Um, and so they have 18 amino acids, and you have 16 grams of protein in three tablespoons. And so high in omega-3 and 6, etc. And so this is another thing. It's really easy to make smoothies with them. It's easy to put them on top of foods. They don't have a particularly strong flavor. Um, and so, and they're, they're high in antioxidants, uh, only the, with cacao being the highest in antioxidants that you can find. So cacao is just chocolate in its raw form. And uh, so this has, it's loaded with antioxidants, has a bunch of trace minerals, and um, it's another just really good nutrient-dense food that you can usually get in like a powder form that I think most people are familiar with. And you can mix it in lots of foods. You can put it in smoothies. Uh, so then, uh, Dr. Campbell's favorite, kale. Um, and so I think most people are familiar with kale and know that kale is really healthy. It's anti-inflammatory, it's nutrient-rich, uh, lots of vitamins. Uh, and so an another food that's becoming more well-known are goji berries. So goji berries are another complete protein, 19 different amino acids, lots of minerals, high in iron, and um, and a strong antioxidant too. So these are so these you usually get them in a dried form. And so the reason I use some I include some of them is that I mean these are things that you can put in, in like a trail mix that can be this can go in cereal, this can be mixed in smoothies. Um, and then finally is spirulina. So spirulina is a blue green algae and it has um, it's very high in protein, it's sixty percent. Uh, and it's another thing that's that's easily mixed into other foods. And you're making the face like it looks disgusting. <laughs> no, I'm counting the amount of calories per six grams of protein. Per six oh. grams of the algae. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's like almost a lot of calories for ten grams. Mm -hmm. It is, but it's it's it, but it's dense. Um, and it's a lot of protein, and it's really it's really easily mixed in lots of other things too. So uh, there's and this, these lists are really really long. But I thought it would be nice just to see what are some really practical things that, 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 that as a student, as a medical student, that I could that I could eat on a daily basis that would be healthy, that the residents could could eat, that we could have introduced into foods that we have all the time. Um, 
And then the last thing is what about protein? So I, I try to include protein in a lot of foods that, to say that, that all of the meals don't have to be meat dense. I mean, I eat meat, I like meat, but uh, there are lots of alternatives too. And uh, here are some of the numbers. So, uh, in short, the superfoods can do this for you. Um, and and I think they really. I think that I think that the way they look at it is that um, that it's difficult being on the wards. I mean, as a student, it is. As a resident, it is. And I think as as attendings, it is too. And there are very few variables that we have control over. We can't. Uh, shortening, I mean, people talk about uh, hours, and I don't think hours are going to get any shorter. And, and then there's workspace, and I don't think we, we can go into hospitals and retrofit the, the resident lounges. Um, and, but I think there are a few small things that we can do on a daily basis that would make, that would help us feel healthier at the end of the week, that would make me feel healthier at the end of the week. Uh, and I think these are some of them, and I don't think they're that impractical to be implemented regularly. Uh, so that's all I've got, and I will pass the baton on. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to go back to this slide only because my son wore a cape for about four years, and <laughs> he's just, um, um, I just love it. But the thing about these superfoods is that we have a choice. We're going to eat something healthy or eat something unhealthy. And a lot of us don't know how to use these. Or if we did, we wouldn't know what they taste like or where to get them. But they're readily available and they're really incredible. Like if you start to pay attention to how you feel after you eat these things, it makes you feel really good. Um, so I think superfoods get their name for a reason because it does make you feel pretty super. Um, so we came up with the mnemonic because everyone loves mnemonics and we're doctors, right? Uh, of sort of some, some food rules about how we as doctors can clean up our diet a little bit. Uh, so the first one is um, grow vegetables. When you start to eat this way, when you're eating a lot of vegetables, you run through vegetables really quickly. And if you're juicing, you run through vegetables extremely quickly. But it's, a, it's so rewarding to be part of the life process, to watch, um, to plant a seed and then to reap the harvest from it. And it, it's a good way to connect you back to nature because we're so dissociated from nature in general in this modern technological era. Organic. So this has been a hot item in the media recently about whether organic foods are more healthful than non-organic foods. And there was that study that came out. Um, and it got a lot of attention. And it said that organic foods are basically what they were saying is there's no benefit to eating organic foods, but what they missed was that organic foods um, have a less of a pesticide load to them. They found that. There's less pesticides on organic foods, and that's why we eat them. We eat them because we don't want the pesticides, which are carcinogens and toxins. And then the other thing, too, is that um, the, the, the organic foods, they don't cause societal and environmental complications in the same way that the foods that are conventionally raised do. And then the most important, I think, for those of us who are concerned about infection prevention and highly resistant organisms is that the pesticide, the non-organic foods, predispose you to getting more of those resistant organisms in your body and being exposed to them. So I don't like that study. I don't agree with the study because the organic foods are the way we should be um, treating our environment and our own bodies. So C, cut back. I'm not saying eliminate, but just cut back. Cut back on alcohol, cut back on caffeine, cut back on meat, cut back on dairy. We don't need to have meat three times a day. I mean, Dave, my husband, would disagree with that, but <laughs> technically we don't. <laughs> and we, we as humans aren't actually meant to be suckling off the cows until we're in our 90s, right? Like, humans, humans are meant to have breast milk until they're weaned and then not really to drink milk anymore. Um, so that's why so many of us are intolerant to it, because we're not evolutionarily designed to, to be drinking so much milk. And then there's the whole issue of the milk that we have and the way we treat our cows. You do take on the stress hormones and the toxins that those cows are exposed to. Even if it's organic milk, if the organic cows are being raised in cruel environments, you take it on. Uh, next, um, L. So, I think the, the most important part of this is to read the labels 
of anything that you buy, anything that you need. Look on the back of it and see what's inside. And a rule of thumb that I try to follow is if there's more than five ingredients, I try not to eat it because then it's really processed. And then also they have tricky ways of hiding high fructose corn syrup in there. They call it other things. Um, but like Robert was saying, if sugar of any type is in the first three ingredients, then probably it's going to make you sick. Um, so eliminate. Uh, you got to find out if you're allergic to stuff. And if you are, you got to stop eating it because it makes you sick. So eliminate all allergens, processed foods, and the high fructose corn syrup. Red dye number six, anything like that, just stop eating it. Uh, and then A, I think A is the most important, is add, just add stuff. We feel, we feel like we have to take all these things away, but there's a lot more that we could be eating. You don't have to go hungry, just add the good stuff, and then slowly start to decrease the bad stuff. Um, so N, nourishing. I think it really makes sense for all of us as physicians to think about how we can nourish and nurture ourselves. We do so much for other people. It's, it's really important to take a step back and think about what you can do for yourself to, to feel like you're being cared for. And then eating natural foods. So for M, monitor intake. Uh, it can be really easy to just get through your day and not even be aware of what you ate and what you didn't eat and what you, you know, and so you go the whole day and you realize you haven't peed. Um, but start to keep track of what it is that you're eating and then start to notice how it makes you feel. And for any behavior change, the first step is awareness. You have to be aware of the fact that, oh, that pizza made me sick. You have to be aware of it, but the only way that you can be aware of it is by paying attention. Which is hard, because the way that we, in general, defend ourselves from the difficulties of our training is that we shut off from the signs of our body. We stop paying attention. We become sort of these walking heads and nothing exists down below. And I think that that's how I ended up having all those problems for all those years is because I just stopped noticing. <coughs> I stopped paying attention. I had pain. And I just kind of stopped paying attention to it. And it's so common for our patients to live in a state of denial, but then also <coughs> for us, too. And then D, dedication. It has to be a priority. Food has to be a priority for all of us. It has to. I mean, the way our medical system is headed, the way our patients are ballooning, the health care costs, like, it's up to us as primary care physicians and hospitalists, too, to, to become dedicated to the purpose of creating healthier food environments for ourselves and for everyone around us. And if we don't do it, then why would they do it, right? If I'm a doctor and I say, you got to lose weight, but then I don't have specific ways to do that, or I don't actually know how to recommend it, or I don't really know much about nutrition, it makes sense that they would mind even stop asking you or may not listen to your advice. Jess? Yes? On the last slide, under C, I didn't hear anything about caffeine. Um, <laughs> oh, so caffeine, caffeine masks, masks your symptoms. So we're tired. We wake up, we drink a big cup of coffee, honey. and then we get tired, and so we drink more coffee. And then we get tired, so we drink more coffee. But maybe the reason we're tired is that we're dehydrated. Or maybe the reason we're tired is that we're hungry. And so coffee can just become a crutch. Um, there's, you know, obviously studies that have shown that coffee can actually be health promoting. And I think that it can. It's just that it can also rub us up and make us quite tense and dehydrated. this. We're, we're not teaching our medical students how to eat. In fact, when they go on the wars, they learn all sorts of unhealthy food behaviors. Um, and Robert and Brittany and I have been coming up with a, a course in elective for the medical students that teaches them how to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. And so we're actually going to be piloting this at Denver Health, my hospital. It's going to be for nurses, doctors, residents, clerks, anyone in the medical community to, to come and experience what it's like to eat anti-inflammatory for two weeks. And I'm really excited about it. <laughs> um, 
um, it's, it's basically a cleanse. You eliminate the bad stuff, but then you learn how to eat all the good stuff, too. And that's no easy task. It, if, you, if you haven't done it before, how do you do it without the support of others at the same time and without some, some guidance? But um, so it's two weeks of eating mostly vegan food and eliminating the processed foods, cutting way back on the coffee and the alcohol, and doing that with friends and coworkers. And so this is in preparation for the spring, which we're going to be doing the medical student elective. Oh, yeah. I like this. So, <laughs> I think you'll find that one of the most empathic doctors around, and you see he's wearing his little gown, his butt sticking out. Um, so what happened to me when I was a resident was probably one of the worst things that could have happened to me, and I'm still suffering from this massive scar tissue. But I've learned so much about what patients go through and what it's like to be a patient who's um, ignored and sometimes humiliated. Um, and to be a patient where Western medicine, as we know it, has nothing to offer me. And that happens all the time for our patients in the hospital. Okay, your cancer's untreatable, or you've got diabetes, but you're not going to change. Or, you know, we, we resign. We resign a lot of our patients to no options. Um, but there are. There are options. And like I said before, a diet and exercise really works. And in order to make our patients listen to us, First, they have to believe us. They have to believe that we believe that it really works. And the way to really believe that it really works is to experience it for yourself. Anyone heard of Pareto's Law? No, he has. No, he has. <laughs> um, I love this law because it lets me off the hook. You know, I, I told you guys I'm, I'm gluten intolerant, so I mostly don't eat gluten. I'm mostly dairy intolerant too, so I don't eat that. Um, and then I try to be vegan, but I'm not a vegan. <laughs> um, so I try to do about 80%. And Pareto's Law, what it says is that 20% of your efforts result in 80% of the outcomes. So this law has been demonstrated in financial systems and healthcare all around the place. And what it tells me is that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be like, okay, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegan for the rest of my life, I'm never going to eat anything else but vegetables. But we can say, all right, you know, maybe today instead of the hamburger, I'm going to choose the quinoa bowl. Or maybe today instead of um, the milkshake, I'm going to have a vegetable smoothie. Uh, you can just make small changes. And small changes can do a really big good for you and for your patients too. Uh, and we were just talking about a TED talk is about being a weekday vegetarian. People are getting creative about this. Even cutting back on meat one day a week or two days a week or all week long makes a big impact on an environmental scale and then on a physical well being scale. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I am perfectly happy being a B minus vegetarian, right? 80% of the time. 80% of the time I don't drink, so maybe, you know, once every five days I'll have a drink. 80% of the time I don't eat cake, but every once in a while I do, and that makes me not feel deprived. Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future, will give no medicines, but will interest her or his patients in the care of the human frame, in a proper diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So guys, we are the future of medicine, right? Like, the time is now. If we don't figure out how to take care of this massive problem we have with chronic illness, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. But we can do it. Like this, this stuff, it works and it's possible. We can make really good changes for ourselves and for our patients with food and exercise. So is any of this, because a, a lot of this was brought up about the wards, which is so true that the meals are not good, <laughs> generally what are served on the wards or at New Report. Um, are you all taking any of this to the chiefs or, you know, trying to change any of what the New Report lunches are? 
yeah. can I say? Yeah. I taught the chief because I complained that there was never salad. There was only one day of salad. And it's like, because the residents won't eat it. So we changed back. We take, took off the salad day and went back to sandwiches for that day. Mm -hmm. So they said that the residents wouldn't eat the healthy food, so they reordered sandwiches. <laughs> that was the chief resident. And I was like, okay. Well, so Jonathan <laughs> Schwartz, our current chief resident, is so interested in food. He wants to do his grand rounds on cardiac hot events and food. And Robert's, Robert's idea is, is really a good one. We're paying probably about $600 a week on these new conference meals, probably. We could probably buy helpful food for about $200 a week, and then we would have $400 to hire a chef. <laughs> I mean, which, which is possible because I actually know one who would be happy to do this work, who wants to do this work. So I think that that is something that we could do among our hospitalist group. Right? You know, we, we could start to get creative about these ideas. And the, the economic discussion that Robert had shows that it doesn't cost that much more. It just requires some foresight and planning. Um, I think there's a curious thing that happens. When I ask most residents, what if, what if we did this? When I proposed it to them, they said, I don't, I don't want to give up pizza. It gets my one like satisfaction. In the day. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was not just in Fort that as I was then happy that he's like, well, no, I tried the salad one day, the restaurants wouldn't eat it, so I went back to sandwiches. Right, but then when I but, but then if I say, but what if what if what if you were to look at it in broader perspective and say, what if you knew by the end of every every week, every five days that you had just one of three meals had been really healthy, and when you weigh it in the end, and when you and when you make this decision after you've eaten and had a full stomach, what, I mean, really, what, what would you prefer? And I think, and ev everyone that I've asked, actually, even those who have been so firm about wanting the pizza once a week, uh, have said, I would prefer, I would prefer overall to eat healthy five days than have, have a really yeah, comforting, greasy yeah. food. And it doesn't have to be exclusive. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a quinoa bowl five days, but it, it could be three, and it would be different. So if you put again that slide when you compare the pizza with the tuna bowl, the healthy bowl has double the calories of the pizza, and almost the same amount of protein, the same amount of everything except for the sodium. Yeah. And the cholesterol, well, the but, saturated fat, the cholesterol. Well, I know, but it's like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna give one of those meals, it's almost half of the calories that are required per day, so are you contributing to obesity with, by that, or do you have like lower calories? <laughs> yeah, I don't think options? so. I don't think that. I don't think that as a whole, it, more calories is negative. I mean, I don't think that because it's more calories that it's it's detrimental. Um, and I think these are really good calories. I mean, I think when you compare the calories, the calories are calories. If you don't if you don't use them, they become fat. No matter how they come true. into your body, if they're healthy calories or unhealthy calories. If you don't waste those calories, they become fat. True. So, but if you, you can, if that's your primary I'm sorry, I'm just saying, for the day. Don't get me wrong. I love mm -hmm. the healthy foods and I eat healthy foods. I'm just saying that when you look at that chart, mm -hmm. it doesn't look appealing to me. I'd rather get my salad without any extra super calories, super food. Have you guys seen um, pork silver knives? Anyone? Sorry. Okay, pork silver knives. They do a very compelling discussion of why the high caloric, high fat meals end up making you eat more overall. Um, because the pizza, you know, it's little, it takes up a little bit of space and your stomach isn't full completely. So you still get hungry after you eat that and so you go junk out, you know. You, you might be satisfied initially, but overall, with eating that kind of food, you eat more calories because you're not in nutrition. Whereas if you eat the protein, the vegetables, your stomach's full. You need to convince me, Jess, because I don't eat pizza. I, I, haven't, I haven't eaten pizza since I was 12, so <laughs> that's, you don't need to convince me. I'm just saying, you won't make me eat it 800 calories in one meal. There's no way you will convince me to eat that. It would also be like one, one cup of, of, of cooked quinoa and then vegetables. So I'm just being, being the advocate of the devil. I'm not trying. So I think we're wrapping up here. Um, for you, those of you that live in Denver, if you want to participate in our nutrition course, it's going to be starting. I have flyers. And then also I'm trying to teach yoga, too. So Friday is um, 5.30 to 6.30, and it's geared towards medical professionals in West Wash Park, and I'd love to see you guys there. It's donation-based. The first class is free. After that, you pay me what you think is fair, but I suggest $10.
Namaste. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming to this talk. I'm um, really honored to have colleagues like you, and I think that we can transform the, the food landscape of our own microclimates, but then also of the entire nation. I believe we have the power to do that.